Truth Ministries, I'm Jim Staley. Before we get into this fairly controversial subject, I'd like to encourage each and every one of you to keep an open mind to the facts and the information that you might find in this, in this video. For some of you, this is the very first time that you've heard anything like this before. You may be shocked. You may be angry. It may rub you the right way. It may rub you the wrong way. But ultimately, about a third of the way through, most of you are going to have this one thought pop into your mind. That's not what it means to me. But in the end, as you finish this video, I would encourage you to remember one thing. That ultimately, it doesn't matter what it means to us. It only matters what it means to Him. After all, He is the potter and we are the clay. And we're only put on this earth for one reason and one reason only. And that's to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And to do so His way. So before you come to any conclusions or presumptions on this topic, I would encourage you to watch this video in its entirety all the way through. Be a Berean. Seek the truth for yourself. And as you continue on your journey to discover the truth, never be afraid of what you might find. Because in the end, the truth can only do one thing, and that's set you free. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jim Staley with Passion for Truth Ministries, and today we are going to talk about a subject that is going to be a little bit sensitive. So I'm going to warn you up front uh, that we are going to dig into the truth. And whenever you dig into the Word of God, uh, it should rub against anything inside of us that's not of Him. So I want you to, to just uh, relax for, for a little while, uh, find yourself a comfortable chair or get yourself some hot coffee or tea and, and just, just relax because we're going to dig in the truth, my friends, into the Word of God and we're going to dig into some things that might be a little bit uh, sensitive. So we're going to, the, the title of this message is called Truth or Tradition. We're going to explore uh, some of the origins of some of the most cherished holidays in Christianity of, uh, of Valentine's Day and Christmas and Easter and we're going to find out exactly where they came from not where just we've been told they come from or what we've been told they mean but we're gonna find out exactly where they came from uh, from history itself so uh, we're gonna talk about truth now when Jesus was here uh, and I like to talk, uh, call him by his Hebrew name, Yeshua. When Yeshua was here, he did one thing. He said, I came to bring a sword of division. And that sword is the truth. And what it does is it does divide. It divides, uh, you know, he said, a, a husband against his uh, wife and a, a father against their daughter or their sons. Because when he drew a line in the sand, it forces us to make a decision of which way to go. And I think many of you would agree with me that over the last 2,000 years, man has had our fingerprints all over the Word of God. And we've changed some of it, we've added some of it, we've taken away from some of it. We have 38,000 denominations uh, worldwide in Christianity that claim to be under the umbrella of Christianity. So we are going to dig into this and uh, we're going to extract just the truth. Because how many of you know that the truth can only do one thing? it sets you free. So one other thing I want to say, because I have five uh, girls myself, and I'm a parent, that if you have small children, this may not be uh, the time for them to watch uh, this program. Uh, there will be some sensitive material that, that we'll be covering in here. So I just want to give you a heads up, because I always appreciate that as a parent. So I'll let you go with that, and uh, we'll get started. 2 Corinthians 11:14 says this. It says, And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. So, you know, when, we were, when we're deceived, we don't know we're deceived. So we're going to find out exactly, exactly what the scriptures say so we can uh, get rid of the enemy uh, and, and get rid of the masquerade that he has, rip the mask right off of him so we can expose him for who he really is. Because I don't know about you, but I want to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Okay? All right. I have a study by Barna Group here, and Barna Group is the world's uh, number one Christian uh, uh, research group. And what they do is they research all kinds of different topics from, from, uh, uh, from what pastors are talking about to current church subjects to social, uh, political things and do polls. And so I just want to read something from them real quickly. This is a study this year that they did. So the Barna Group uh, uh, came up with this uh, in recent year end review of Christianity as a whole. This is what they concluded. 
The problem facing Christianity is not that people lack a complete set of beliefs. The problem is that they have a full slate of beliefs in mind, which they, they think are consistent with biblical teachings, and they are neither open to being proven wrong nor to learning new insights. This is Barna Group saying this. It may, it may well be that spiritual evaluation is so uncommon because people fear that, it, that the results might suggest the need for different growth strategies or for more aggressive engagement in the growth process. No matter what the underlying reason is, the bottom line among bo both the clergy and the laity alike was indifference toward their acknowledged lack of evaluation. Now what that is saying there real quickly very simply, is they're saying that they don't like to be audited. We as Christians do not like to do what everyone else in the world does and audit our belief system. We don't like to, to ask questions because we have the idea that we have all the answers already. So there's no reason to ask and to make sure that what we believe is correct. But in every walk of life, outside of religion, we audit our lives, do we not? And our businesses, we audit our businesses. We audit our families to make sure that, that you know, when there's problems, that we adjust. Well, I don't know about you, but I think you would agree with me that, that, that crime is an all-time high. Uh, the divorce rate is an all-time high. Abuse is an all-time high. Within Christianity, something's wrong. We need to adjust and start looking at potential things that are causing these issues. So let's dig into... Uh, the word and find out exactly uh, what it says. Is it faith to understand nothing and merely submit your convictions implicitly to the church? That's a quote by John Calvin. Truth or tradition? So hold on with us. We're going to dig into the scriptures today. We're going to dig into history, and I think you're going to like it. It's going to be very fascinating. For some of you, it will be shocking information of what you're going to learn. The plan of the enemy, my friends, is to steal, kill, and destroy. That is what his job is. That's what he does. And let me ask a question. What does he steal, kill, and destroy? What is he trying to steal, kill, and destroy? The truth. The truth is what he's trying to masquerade. That's what he's trying to hide. Because he knows that if God's people understand and know the truth, it will free them from his bondage, his class, his claws, and allow them to be all that they were created to be. The plan of the enemy from the beginning was to change the truth just enough. You know, if you, if you were, if, if, in the old days, if they wanted to kill a king, they did it by putting just a little bit of poison inside of his wine. That's why they had the cupbearer that would make sure that, that there was no poison to kill the king. You would never make it obvious. Matter of fact, you would make it so unobvious that the person that was being deceived would never even know that they were being deceived. That is the true epitome of deceit. And that is what our Lord calls uh, the enemy, is a liar and a deceiver, and he was that from the beginning. So we have to be very careful and continually audit what we, what we believe to make sure that we're not being deceived. Abraham Lincoln said it this way. He said, the best way to destroy your enemy is to make him your friend. And I'm going to submit to you that from the enemy's perspective, we're the enemy to him. And the only way to destroy us is to make us his friend. And the only way he can do that is by coming as an angel of light. John F. Kennedy said it this way. He says, the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. My friend, Satan has no other plan but to add to and take away from the Word of God. What are some of the most influential events in human history since the creation of time? We're going to walk through this because I want to show you and build this up and set the foundation of why this is so important. Some of the most influential events in, in human history are the following. I think these are my top four, in my opinion. Number one, the giving of the commandments in the garden. When God told Adam and Eve, here's what I want you to do, that was number one. Number two, top four events. Number two, the giving of the commandments at Mount Sinai. I would say that was probably a pretty incredibly significant event that the enemy would not want us uh, uh, to understand what happened there. Number three, the birth of the Messiah. 
And number four, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah. So if those are the top four events in all of human history, then if you were the enemy, what would you try to do? Well, you would do exactly what he's done, is get people to be misguided in how those events took place and to make us stumble on those events. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at. Now, we, we already understand that Adam fell and he did a good job at deceiving Adam. We already understand that when the commandments were given on Mount Sinai, that he got God's people away from just keeping the actual commandments and adding to them and taking away from them. Well, now we're going to focus on the birth of the Messiah and the resurrection of the Messiah. And you're going to see how powerful the birth and the resurrection of the Messiah really are because the enemy is working overtime to deceive God's people in some areas. So if those are the top four, then what do you think Satan's main goal is? To steal, kill, and destroy. And how have you established that he does that? Remember, he cannot change the truth. So the only thing that he can do is add something to it. A lie. So I'm going to tell a story. Once upon a time. Now many of you out there have never heard this story before on uh, uh, where we get Easter from or, and Christmas. So it starts off, believe it or not, with the great-grandson of Noah, and his name was Nimrod. And Nimrod was a mighty hunter on the, in the land. He was, a, uh, he was the, the king of the world at that known time. He built Nineveh. Uh, he was known for his drunkenness, his covetousness, his strength. Uh, he had great armies. Uh, he built uh, the Tower of Babel and the, and the city of Nineveh. He was ruler of the then known world, okay? Known for idolatry, his rebelliousness towards God. For all intents and purposes, he was a bad guy, okay? And what happened was he, when he died because he was king of the earth, they deified him. He was the first person on earth that the people of the earth deified. And they made him the sun god, and his name was Baal, okay? And that's really important. But before he died, he married a, a young lady named Semiramis, okay? And Semiramis was his, his wife. So when he died and they, and they deified him, he became the sun god. And then shortly thereafter, as, as, as uh, luck would have it in the Babylonian legend, she gets pregnant by the rays of her deceased husband, Baal, Nimrod. And she has a son called Tammuz. And Tammuz now is the resurrected Nimrod. He also became a very a big hunter, and he became a ruler instead of his husband, in the, his hus or instead of his in father's stead, excuse me. And he basically took the place of his father. Well, one day, uh, this is very fascinating. One day he was out hunting, and uh, he was 40 years old, and he got killed by a wild boar. Okay. And so what happened was after that, they, uh, they deified him as the son of God, the son of God. You can see how the enemy, as I tell the story, is, uh, is beginning to, to, he knows the beginning from the end, and he's beginning to rewrite history before history actually happens. And so Tammuz becomes the baby of Semiramis. And by the way, Semiramis also marries her own son. Okay, we'll find out what that ended up being in today's tradition as well. So Tammuz is the son of Semiramis. He becomes the reincarnated Nimrod. And then every year after that, for 40 days, because remember, Tammuz was 40 years old, for 40 days before uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the spring equinox, excuse me, they would not eat. They would fast. And that's where we get Lent from, Okay. Now, when Semiramis dies, they deify, 